Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of combat sports, the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how was Las Vegas? UFC 300, give it to us. No, I mean, listen, most of you saw it for yourself. Uh, boxing could never do that. I mean, I know there's a lot of morons and haters out there, and Paulie Malinaji, who I really respect a lot, and I do the pro box show with him and Chris Algieri, two really smart former world champions. Uh, Paulie's right. He says there's so many idiots out there, but some of them are, some of the fans, you know, are smart, but some are, are just so moronic. And you don't know if it's just because they're dumb or if sometimes it's because they have an agenda, they hate you. And and sometimes I find they, they use pseudo names where they know you, they don't like you, but they're too cowardly and sleazy, <laughs> you know, to, to do it in their own in their own presence. They're called they're called burner accounts. They control you from an anonymous account. So whatever you say, you can say nice things about human beings. They say, "Oh, you're you're this or you're that." You know, no, you're that. Actually, you must hate people. If someone's saying something nice and you're knocking them for saying something nice, you must hate people. You must be a, a bad person. Um, Those are very unhappy so people. You imagine if I told you, Ken, Ken, what are you doing? Oh, Teddy, I've been talking shit to people online for a couple hours. I feel so much better about myself. Even with people you disagree with, unfollow them. Don't waste your time. But, but a lot of them are just really snivering cowards to be honest of they course should be ashamed of course of themselves. but if they could be ashamed of themselves they wouldn't be those people so that's 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 an right oxymoron to say that they should be ashamed <laughs> of themselves so but one of the things that they from what someone told me that they were taking shots was that i said for boxing to ever come close to emulating the card that UFC 300 put on in Vegas the other night. You'd have to bring back the likes of Muhammad Ali, Joe Lewis, Sugar Ray Robinson. I didn't mean it literal. I mean, I know that those guys are iconic. I know that those guys are one of a kind. I know those guys, how, how special they are in the history of boxing. Um, I, I was making a point, you morons. I, I wasn't being literal. I was making a point that you're not going to see. Basically, what I was going to say is <laughs> boxing cannot, in its current state, cannot ever match and put on a show top to bottom like UFC put on with the level of fighters fighting each other, with champions fighting former champions, champions fighting champions, some of them a little past them, their best <laughs> uh, as far as where they are in the twilight of their career. But the name just... Just the the name value, the 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 ability to for fans to recognize each fighter, to be able to identify with these fighters, to put top guys together. You can't do that, Bob, because the promoters won't let you. Because one promoter owns one guy, another promoter owns another guy, and they won't come together unless there is one. I'll put one little exception and I'll qualify what I just said they're starting to do that with Turkey al Sheik in Saudi Arabia yes they are starting to do that he is starting to do that but nothing up to now compares to what was done in Las Vegas with UFC 300 nothing nothing yeah you're gonna have the great fight with Fury and 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 music and you're gonna have Beaver better be magnificent. But the undercards can never match what was what I just left. So and it was electric, the fans appreciated it. It was great. Um you know it, it's I'm I'm glad that we do have Turkey Al Sheik in box I really am in boxing now. I am because we are starting to get the fights that otherwise we'd never get. The only way we ever got like a fight like Pacquiao and Mayweather was when the money was so enormous that the two promoters had to come together. 
and that that happens every you know that happens every uh, Haley's comment. It, it, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't happen, and and that happened five years too late. To make it happen now is like I said without what's going on in Saudi Arabia, it's almost impossible. So anyway, a great 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 night, great show. Great commentary with all the people that I work with there. Head again from head to toe, from 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 you know the, every one of them knows what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. Um, it was and and it was just an extra cherry on top that my son could be there. I could be there with my grandson, um, my son's wife. We had a room. We've got an extra room right next to me and my wife. She was there with me, and my grandson was sleeping with us every night with me and my wife. Uh, there's nothing better in the world than getting kicked all night long in the back and stomach by a five-year-old that you love. There's nothing better. <laughs> Not Try it, people. Someday try it. Forget about chiropractic work. Forget about going to your psychiatrist to get into a better mood. Just sleep with your grandson and let him kick you in the neck and the back and everything. And then every <laughs> once in a while, his arm goes around you and, and he hugs you uh, in his sleep. In his sleep. So it was a great weekend. It was really, really was. I want to uh, send out a happy Passover uh, I know Passover is, I think it's just about to begin um, with uh, all of the people out there who celebrate Passover. I, I want to make sure that I say that. And as I said, it was just a, a terrific, terrific weekend. Uh, I was on ESPN Friday and Saturday with all the great ones, with John Anik, with Anthony Smith, with... Chael Sonnen with Michael Bisping, and and then of course you had all the other you had DC and you had uh, you had Megan. I was on with Megan too. Uh, you had DC and of course Joe Rogan. Just again, top to bottom, tremendous, tremendous, very good. Uh, let's go. Uh, before we start with the fights, I want to mention one that we're not going to talk about. <laughs> yeah, you heard me right. <laughs> of course, I'm talking about it. All right, another oxymoron. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to mention, I'm going to, we're going to do all UFC. We're going to do a pre preview afterwards of the fight coming up next week, which is Ryan Garcia and Haney, which everybody's interested in out there in the boxing world. But I want to, before anybody takes any shots at me again, I just want to, and it's okay. It's, it's America. You can take any shots you want. It's better if they're justified, but even if they're not justified, it's America. You can do whatever you want, freedom of speech. Um, and we appreciate you watching the show, so it's okay. You bought a ticket. Good. Do whatever you want. Like Muhammad Ali said, half the people came to hope he lost, half came because they liked him, but they all bought a ticket. And that's all that mattered. I, we're not going to talk about, to the extent other than I'm mentioning it uh, real quick, but I didn't bother to watch or get prepared for the Jared Anderson heavyweight fight on ESPN because I know he's 17 and 0. I know he's a talented kid, you know, and I hope he stays out of trouble. I know he got in trouble, you know. Everybody could get in trouble. Let's just hope he he stays out of it and he's learned his lesson. You know, what was that? A couple of months ago. But I'm, that's not why I'm not talking about him. When he fights a meaningful fight. When he fights a competitive fight, a fight where he can be tested. I know he's athletic. I know that, you know, uh, he's a big heavyweight. He's young. I get it. But he hasn't fought anyone yet to test him in really in any kind of way. Uh, he, he won. He went to 17-0. He won a 10-round, you know, easy decision over Riot Murray, who's 32-3 and now. Uh, former cruiserweight champion, so you know he and and it was a one-sided fight. Again, he he never had to in any way deal with anything, overcome anything, get pushed in any way. When he fights again, a meaningful contested fight, we've we've ported on him in the past, um, but I, I'm not gonna take a lot of time to report on a guy that fought on a night where you had so many contested fights. 
Even I don't care if it was in UFC instead of boxing. Uh, and any fans that disagree with me, fine. Go ahead. I think you're wrong, but th- that's fine. You think I'm wrong too. But on that card, there was a contested heavyweight fight. Uh, a Jogba, who's now 20-1, and one, won a split decision over Vianello, who's 12-2-1. Ajagbi was hurt in the second round, but he, then he took control uh, of the fight from that point on into maybe the last couple rounds where Vianello uh, made a run at him. That was a split decision. That was contested. That was contested. L- let Ajagbi is at least being in fights where he's tested. You know, obviously he got tested too much. He lost the fight. But let Anderson who always seems to fight on the card, they're both ESPN fighters, fights on the card with a jobby, let them fight each other. At least uh, do that. Or let him, let Anderson fight again. Anybody who's going to make him break a sweat in the way that I talk about breaking a sweat, where not just you're perspiring, but where you're, you're getting to a point where you have to, show a little bit of a sign of what you are other than a good athlete. So anyway, that's enough. I spent more time on it than I expected to. Um, let's get to the fights that were contested. Let's get to the fights that were competitive. Uh, which one do you want to start with, Mr. Rideout? Um, let me let's know. Start with, let's start with the uh, the final fight on the prelims, Yuri Prohaska against Alexander Rakic. Wow. Um, wow. How awesome do you fight. how how do you how do you argue with me? Well, we're gonna talk about that kind of firefight stuff, that kind of okay corral shootout, Sam. How are you gonna argue and say, oh well, you didn't talk about Jared Anderson? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> oh Pro Prochavik and and Ratchik. Oh, big first round. I'll I'll cover it fast. You you say something about it too, Ken. But for me, big first round for Ratchik. Um, you know, set strong guy catching Prochavchik coming in. Prochavchik, you can catch him coming in. You can time him coming in. Uh, he's got a great chin. <laughs> he's got a great heart. They all do. But um, he's very reckless with his aggression. I know he's awkward, but he's not that awkward. Because, yeah, with his arms down, it looks like he's very awkward, unorthodox. And he throws the uppercut from nowhere, punches from nowhere. But he's not that awkward. I'll tell you why. It's a little bit of a mirage for me as a trainer. Because at the end of the day, where he's not awkward, where he's not unorthodox, where he's not, you know, clever, awkward, we call it awkwardly clever, is that he's always coming straight in with his body and his head. And if you're set to punch and you get away from all the other stuff that could throw you off, if you just set the punch, you could time the guy every time when he comes forward. He's very, very predictable that way. So... That's what Ratchik did. He timed him coming in. Oh, my goodness. He was catching him all kinds of shots. Big round for <laughs> Ratchik. And then what happens? Oh, well, he gets through the fire. I mean, what, what determination? What heart? Prochavchik gets, gets through the fire. And then the, more of the same in the second round. But what does he do? He just keeps coming. He keeps coming. He he just, you know, he, he's like one of those guys in the circus that eats fire. That's what yep. he is, Sam. He's a guy. To, see if you can get a picture, uh, Rob, of a guy that eats fire. You know, I love guys that eat fire. <laughs> you know what I mean? They eat the fire and then they spit it out, whatever they do, right? They burp and then smoke comes out of their mouth. That's... That's what Prochavchik does. He burps, smoke comes out of his mouth. Really. He, he, he waded through the fire in the second round. And what's he do? He stops, he stops Rodrick in an unbelievable, unbelievable rock'em, sock'em robot fight. So what, do you, what do you want to add to that, uh, Ken? I was just going to say, I feel like without, d- 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 without um, diminishing... Prohaska's performance, I feel like he's got more toughness than talent because I was going to say what you said. He's so He was so easy to hit and especially kick, but Jesus, he took a beating. I mean, Rakic was kicking the crap out of him. I thought that the tide was you, like... Did you ever see like, the fight with Texera just... when he fought Texera? Who, who, yes, whose exactly. pictures should be up for toughness. I mean, yep. uh, when he fought him, 
Oh, my God, the two of them. The beating, the punishment they took, and Provodzik wound up winning that fight. But go ahead, I'm sorry. I was I was thinking about what you would normally say with the tide coming in, and I felt like, oh, the tide is coming in on Prohaska. He's about to get washed out to sea. And then he, he just turns the tide and just starts landing on Rakic. He, I mean, no one could have been more surprised than Rakic in his corner because I was convinced he was going to knock out Prohaska, but credit to Prohaska, sometimes the uh, toughness outweighs talent, I guess, because he took everything they had to offer and finally landed the one shot that got and I Rakic give credit, in trouble, and then he closed the show. I want to give credit to Ian Parker, who does the handicapping for ESPN. He does a really good job, and he... He picked, he picked, uh, that's the job. He picked Prohacek in that fight. And, uh, Prohacek, I'm sorry. And, and it didn't look good. <laughs> he didn't look happy. We're watching the first round with Rodrick. I was watching it with him. And he didn't look happy. But in the end, uh, Prohacek made him happy because uh, he, he made him a winner. He made him look really smart. And he is smart, Ian Parker. So a little shout out to him. Um, yeah. Let's get to the next fight. Let's move, baby. Let's Bo move, Nickel, move, the move. wrestling superstar, continues his run of dominance. He manhandled Cody Brundage. Cody Brundage probably put up a little more resistance than any of Nickel's opponents to date, but what a way to start the uh, main card. One one cut fight that we're not going to cover, though, real quickly was, did you see Kayla Harrison just How about that weight drop? How Holly about that Holmes? weight drop? She became another. She went from she went from a big person to a small and didn't miss a beat. Physically fit, big, strong, unbelievable. The only thing I'd say about that, and then you could finish it, is that I called Holly Holmes' fights fifteen years ago on ESPN or somewhere in the neighborhood. Uh, boxing. She's tremendous. I have nothing but admiration for Holly Holmes. What she's done. She's a, she's an incredible woman, an incredible warrior. But she's 40 or 41 years old, and it's probably time now for her to enjoy the rest of her life and just walk into the sunset with all her accomplishments. Because at this point in her career, she's taken a lot of punishment, a lot of miles on the odometer, and she just... She doesn't belong in there with these young, strong women at this point anymore. She used no, to. that's perfect but description. Not, not anymore, but man, that Caitlin uh, Harrison, am I saying her Kayla name right? Harrison, yeah. Ka Ka Kayla. Kayla Harrison, yeah. Kayla Harrison. Two-time Olympic gold medalist. She, she did everything that you want to see one do when they got so many accolades, <laughs> when they're going in there with such... You know, hyperbole. It's not hyperbole if it's real. Uh, with her, it's real. When when you're going in there with with that kind of publicity, with that kind of expectation, that's like you know, that's like the old movie where the the, the young star goes out on on the stage in Broadway and becomes a star. Uh, you just became a star. They go out on the stage and and be the star that you want to be, that you're here to be. And that's exactly what Harrison did. She went out there, um, she she was that star, she she was every bit as good as as all the uh expectation, all the you know, press clippings with her. Uh she she lived up to every bit of that and um and, and she and the weight drop is just another phenomenal thing that she could go from one person to another person and like I said not miss a beat she had said it before in interviews if in the last like few years when she first got into mma that the only way she'd make 135 is to cut a leg off i met her a few times at the new york athletic club when i lived in new york and she was sponsored by the uh, i was on the olympic committee that was responsible for handing out funding and i met her a few times super kind super nice but respectfully huge i mean huge she is like she's jacked I think she, she was big at one, 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 135. At Ken, at 135 the other night, I was looking at her back, and I was like, oh, my God. She she is so massive. She is so strong. She is so big, and she made all that weight drop. And she, I mean, it's, it's and she's so fit. Oh, wow. She, the way she handled Holly, it was... I don't know about you, but I almost found it hard to watch. Like, Jesus, who put Holly in with this girl? Like, call off the dogs. This is a 
brute, the brutal beating and just ragdolled her. But credit, uh, shout out to Kayla Harrison. But Bo Nickel, similar performance against Cody, Cody Brundage. Not as dominant as Kayla, but... Bo Nichols just too strong, too much right now, at least for the competition of guys he's fighting now. No no disrespect to Cody Brundage, but I'm ready for Bo Nichols to get in. Bo Nichols to get in with some uh, stiffer competition. He's way, way outclassing the guys he's been in with now. How'd you like it? Listen, he went to his strength. We know what his strength does is. He's a great, great, great wrestler. Um, he went, took it to his territory where he got Brundage, who's a really been a tremendous fighter. Um... And, and tough guy, everything. Uh, he got him to the floor. People booed. They wanted action like they had earlier before that fight, which which was a tough, it was a tough act to follow. They they were following oh, the, yeah. you know, the act of what we just talked about with Provacic and, and um, Ratchik. I mean, impossible. It's like a band following the, you know, following the Rolling Stones. I mean, you know, it, <laughs> it, ain't gonna, it, ain't, it ain't gonna work well. It ain't gonna work well for you. People booed. They wanted action uh, like they had earlier. It's not gonna happen. It's not the style right now of Bo Nickel. He went to his strength. Um, first round, it was, of course, all Nickel on the mat. Bundridge did well just to survive. But in the second round, Nickel got what he wanted. And what, what, you know, what makes him tick, what makes him, you know, uh, obviously the prospect that he is. He got the submission. I, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why they boo. Uh, they don't always boo when it's on a mat. I'm not saying that you have to strike to not get booed in the UFC. That's, of course, we know that's not true. What I realized that night is the people will not tolerate it if one guy is just surviving. If one That's guy right. is just That's surviving, exactly right. Yeah. You know, Ken, if one guy is just surviving on the mat and the other guy is looking to submit him, they're gonna boo. They're not they don't they didn't sign up for that. They didn't buy a ticket no, for you're that. You're right. But it by by contrast, if you look but if at they, Chandler, no, no, but if the other guy the grounds, but but no, but that's the point. If but if both guys are wrangling for position. If both guys yep. are playing what I call floor chess, where they're both trying to get that dominant position, they're both trying to win on the floor. You know, they're both trying to you know find that edge. Then, then there's no booing. Then that's just as exciting in, in its own realm as standing and striking is because it's so interesting. It's it's so strategic. It's so technical. It's so physical, and and it's so competitive. I mean, it, it's a it's a it's a war. It's a war. The only difference is they're not standing during the war. They're on the floor, but they're warring it out on the floor, trying to get position, trying to get to submission. But if one guy is just surviving, well, that's that's where you get the booze. That's where you get where people are saying, hey, you know, come on, let's, let's get to submission and move on. A good example of exciting on the floor would have been, for instance, Poirier and Chandler. When they were on the floor, they were both still... You didn't know who was in control. The guy on the bottom, the guy on the top. It was constant reversals. It was even when Bo Nichols just swarming a guy and the guy's just trying not to get submitted. That's when you get the booze to your point. Yep. Um, next fight. What's next? Oliveira, the great, talking about a guy who's great on the floor. Is it Oliveira? Yo, he and looked, he, Oliveira and Armand took, took, Sarukian, I help you. I'm always there to help. Sarukian, <laughs> Sarukian, 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 and Oliveira. Sam is smiling <laughs> here. When it comes to pronunciations, you always got me there, brother. I'll always pull you out of trouble. Don't worry, I got the rope. <laughs> Oliveira had him in a couple dangerous spots in one of the end of one of the rounds. I forget which round, but Sarukian barely survived. He got up and he looked like he was half he was half sleeping, and I uh, came back. But he gets a split decision. Um, excellent fight, Ex super entertaining. Could have gone either way. I thought I wouldn't have had a problem either way. But um, I'm going to ask you a question. Maybe Rob, I have to look it up. I'm not sure. Oliveira did an illegal kick to the face when they were on the floor in the first round. Did yes. he get a point taken yep. away? No. That's important to know. I, he I, didn't, right? I, I, don't, I don't think so, Rob. I'll check it while you're talking. I don't no, think he, he did. No, he didn't. Rob just but said he didn't. 
That's a good point though, because I've said this before, like theoretically, if you have a man who's just getting beat up and in trouble, like what's to prevent the fighter, if you're not gonna take a point on the first warning, what's to prevent someone from kicking you as hard as they can if, if he's behind on the scorecard, hard as he can with a groin kick? Up kick from the, oh, I mean, the, the dangerous, face. you knock the guy out or the guy can't continue. No, and but to your point, you. or, or kicking the guy in the face to get him off you, you're not allowed to do that. It's a, it's a very serious rule. If it's that egregious, I have no problem with a point on the first on the first infraction because, like I said, if you're behind and you do that and your only goal is, I don't care, I'll, I'll take the warning, but this guy's going to be slowing down if I kick him in the groin or the face as hard as I can. I just wish that the ref, that, that rule was a little bit more strict with the first infraction. If it's incidental, okay, it looks like it was a mistake, but the ref should have some discretion to be like, no, 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 that was way too... Way too egregious. There have to be some repercussions. Otherwise, what's to prevent someone from doing that as a strategy? Before I get to my analysis of this fight, let me ask another question. <laughs> Did you guys see what I saw live? I never saw a replay. Obviously, they didn't want to show one. But I tell me if I was seeing things. I saw Tzirkian on his way to the ring go into the stands and punch somebody. He threw a punch. I didn't see it land, but I think someone did or said something to him, and Sarukian threw a wild punch, and it didn't connect from what I can okay. see in the stands. But nevertheless, I'm sure no, he's going to get a stern talking either. to. When I say punch somebody, I guess what I should have said was punch at somebody because I yeah. couldn't see. If I couldn't see other than I saw he he all of a sudden he went from going towards the ring to he made a he made a a beeline to somebody in the stands threw a punch and then they brought him back and I, and it never really got explained because I'm watching it live in person so I'm not listening to the commentary I was just wondering if it was ever explained. It was, ne it was never explained to the best of my. I didn't hear him explain it, but I have seen a lot of clips about it. I don't know what the person in the stands did, but Zarukian's lucky he didn't hit him because you punch someone in the crowd. Like, there's no nothing to prevent you from getting arrested. You might be fighting, although sometimes they deserve it. And listen, I'm not uh, 100%, advocating. 100%, but I'm you can't do it. I'm not advocating. I laughing with my brutal uh, candidness, but I I'm not advocating for it. I'm not for violence, for that stuff at all. I'm not. But some of these idiots could be taught a lesson that might serve them down a road where maybe it would teach them not to say things they shouldn't be saying to people they shouldn't be saying it to, to anyone. And it might actually save them a few teeth uh, <laughs> later in their life. But getting to the, ana I, I digress, uh, getting to the analysis, uh, once we got past that, uh, it was an, a very interesting fight. Uh, Tzirkian survived. Uh, a chokehold, I don't know what the technical term is, a guillotine, whatever it was, you know better, triangle this, that, kuka kaka. You know what? He, he had him in an arm triangle, and I saw one of yeah. the Gracies explaining after the fact. You talk about the one at the end where uh, Sarukian was flat on his belly, and it looked like, is he out? It looked like he was sleeping, but yeah, apparently... Yeah, the referee had to the, get down close to look. Yeah, apparently, the and this is where the ref really has to understand grappling because I saw one of the Gracies, like I said, explaining this, and he said one of the strategies for avoiding getting choked out in that choke in particular is to get flat on your belly because what you don't want to do is get on your side almost like you're rolling into the choke and the guy can like really put tremendous leverage on top of your arm. In other words, them. what you're describing very well there, and I'm glad you are, and, and teaching people... In other words, you want to give him less to choke. He did exactly what you're supposed to do from a jujitsu perspective, from what I understand from uh, one of the Gracies. Get flat other, yeah, when you lay flat, when you lay his... flat, there's nothing to choke. When you try to fight it, there's something to choke. If you roll into it, they can. He can push down pressure on your on your shoulder, forcing it up higher against your ear. From what I understand, and the choke gets a, a blood choke where it's choking off the jugular. Yeah, you you get more leverage and you get is. more. Yep. I guess it's kind of like a fighter in my business where a f opponent stands square. When you stand yep. square in front of the guy, there's there's a lot of talking to hit. You don't want to give him a lot exactly. of talk. So if you get up square or towards what you're saying, there's more body neck to choke but if you get flat That's there's it. less to choke i don't know 
That's my that's exactly that right. is no, my simplification exactly right. simplification of it. Um, but I'm glad you explained it. You explained it better than I did, and I'm glad you you did give the fans an explanation from the great Gracies, who really are the guys that started UFC. Besides the Creative Brothers, of course, and Dana White and the brand that they built us into and that Dana has built us into is unbelievable but the Gracies were they they were the guys they were at the beginning of UFC that's right um the one other thing Teddy I I, I would say about the um the guys like Saruki and guys with a heavy wrestling pedigree I've found that those guys you have to choke them completely unconscious before they'll tap if they even tap because well, if you're I completely unconscious, it's kind of hard to tap. But go ahead. Yeah, but they, they're used to being in those uncomfortable positions, and they understand how to stay calm for a lot longer. And the other thing is, we've talked about this before, but when you're training in jiu-jitsu and you get someone in a deep choke, in training, you're going to tap and start over again. In a fight, where it's a fight basically to the death. I bet you like these no guys don't. Give up. I bet you, yeah. I bet you, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to argue you on that one. But I'm, I bet you these special guys... They don't. Uh, they because once you start that habit, it 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 it, it's, it becomes something that you you would actually uh, give thought to. Something that you would uh, even in practice where it don't count. But you don't want to practice anything that you never want to do. And I would yeah. argue that those guys with that mentality, with that 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 warrior, just that Viking warrior, <laughs> samurai mentality. This I would believe that even in practice they're not going to submit they're gonna they're gonna practice relaxing they're gonna practice getting flat that you just talked about they're gonna practice you know what they got to do to to get out of it to survive it but i i would just think that those guys i know this is gonna sound i i don't know i'm just guessing at it and i admit that but i would say that they i would just say they'd be afraid to practice something that they would never do uh, or something that's not part of their belief system of their code of conduct that's that's just how i yeah. would feel the one thing i would say is that when you're practicing some of these moves especially learning new submissions if you don't tap you can it's so easy to get hurt because you start flailing around especially when it involves uh, you're the probably neck right. but and when you have someone in a choke, like what they always say at Cameron's practices, like, yo, take care of your training partners. If you hurt these guys, you don't have someone to train with. So it's like twofold. It's like you'll tap to just reset or you might not choke them or go for an arm bar, especially or a Kimura where you're wrenching the arm as tight because it's training. But when you get in the ring where it's like almost like a fight to the death, for lack of a better term. Now, all of a sudden, you got guys going for submissions as hard as you possibly can, and you've got guys resisting tapping. Of course. And it's just crazy that more people don't sustain, like, real bad injuries, but these guys are so tough, it's, like, next level. I mean, you just you can't comprehend how, unless you've done any training at all and seen this thing live. It's hard to understand how incredible these guys are. Well, how, how tough, how how... That's right. How durable, how fit, exactly. fit they are. But I would just say this towards that, towards the point you made. In training, I would think that your your partner, whoever that is that you're training with, is not going to bring it to a submission. They would let up before they got to that point. Yes, so you're probably exactly. never going to really, you're really never going to be confronted with a full out assault on a submission because they get yep. you vote they get you clean but 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 i don't think they're gonna choke you out in training i think they're gonna get no, you to the right. point and then let up but you'll what's you'll like this one i said to uh cameron was training the other day and he was rolling with the kid who was relatively new but not not completely inexperienced and i said cam it looked like you were like going easy there and he said that I need to go just hard enough to give this guy a good look and train with him, but I'm not trying to like destroy his confidence either. And I was like, he, he, Cameron just kid. sometimes understands and it probably has to do with him having a uh, boxing coach like you because he uh, every day he mentioned something about That's Teddy. What do you kid. think Teddy would say about this? What do you think about that? And I told him when he said that, I said, I'm going to tell Teddy you said that because that's a mature, responsible thing. Take care of your training partners, but help them get better at the same time. Well, that's just a, that's really just a good human being that you raise. 
and you and your wife are yeah. raising. No, I mean, that speaks to that. Trying. Let me finish the analysis of yep. Oliveira to Sorkin. So, no, 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 nothing to be side, but we covered it. Um, first round, incredible. To Sorkin survives. Uh, he, he survives the, you know, he survives the great Oliveira, uh, who's just unbelievable on the mat. He's a good striker, too, but he's a former champion. He's he's great. He's 34 years old. Tsurkian is seven years younger at 27. Um, Zarukian is his name. Zarukian. Starukian. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if the seven years served him. Maybe it did. But at the end of the day, uh, Starukian, you know, he... He he does uh, he does an incredible job surviving that 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 triangle whatever the fuck it is it's it's a nasty hole <laughs> um, he you know uh, and then he um, and then the second round Starukian I, I I gave the first round to Oliveira and then. So, so the only thing I was in doubt was, was there a point taken away? Is it going to become a 9-9 round? That was the only thing I yep. had a question of, about. But then, otherwise, first round to Oliveira. And then Starukian uh, went into Oliveira's territory on the floor and and he, you know, he, he handled himself. He Matter of fact, he, in, in my estimation, he, he won on the floor in that second round. And then the third round, for me, that's what it was going to come down to. And Starukian had an edge uh, early on. He was initiating. He was being in charge. He was being the boss. Oliveira got a takedown, uh, had him in a hold for a second. And then, you know, like I said, I, I thought there was an edge to Starukian. But then all of a sudden... Oliveira possibly stole the third round at the end when he had Starukian again in one of those submission holds. But Starukian refused to submit, of course. Uh, it was an incredible back-and-forth battle of skill and will. I The only thing I thought after that, I wasn't even thinking about who won. I was thinking, man, I wish this was five rounds instead of three. Yep. Really. Same. Really. Uh, Same. Uh, I. I mean, uh, and and I heard some of the great fighters uh, that that I have the privilege of working with. You know, Chael and and Bisping and Anthony Smith. They were they were echoing the same thing. Man, it's a. Uh, this should have been five. Uh, well, uh, shame it's not five rounds. Um, the it was uh, the referee wasn't sure if Sarukian was uh, unconscious. He he had to. Well, was that in the third round when actually when when it got to that point? I I made it sound like it was in the first round. Um, when I think the first round, Sarukian survived the the chokehold. Um, I think it was two rounds. I think he survived. Yeah. The, um, I thought that maybe he had him in the triangle in the end of the fight. I wonder which one check. was worse because at the I, he survived two really difficult holds. I um, thought the first one where he had him in the rear naked, it looked like he might have been unconscious. A uh, similar thing happened in the next fight too. In the, uh, sorry, in the co-main where the the Yan looked like she Wei Li Zhang choked her out and right as the bell oh, sounded, yeah. they let her up and she was like, but I'm just getting those two confused. Let me see if I can find which round he had him in the rear naked. I know he had him really in those holds twice. First round yes. and then the third round, but um, I'm not sure which was the round where the referee actually had to get down to the ground to see, uh, you know, to make sure he wasn't unconscious. But uh, at, at the end of the day, split decision, Sarukian. I, I was, I, I was thinking, I was thinking a draw. Um, I know you don't get a lot of draws in UFC, but I was thinking a draw. I was one point either way. I, I'm not going to argue with. It was really, really close. Um, my argument, if I'm going to go towards an argument of why Sarukian should get it, was that I thought that other than the dramatic moments, and they were dramatic, um, with Oliveira having Sarukian almost in submission holds, other than that, I thought Sarukian did more and was more consistent 
throughout the rounds. Is that fair to Teddy, say? In the, yes. In the first round, Zarukian survived. <laughs> I'm going to get killed by the fans for saying it rare naked. I, I messed up. He no, survived really. an arm in guillotine at the end of the first to get out of the round. That was what it was. It wasn't a rear naked. So he survived that in the in the first round. And I'm just I just want to confirm that the oh, arm no, that's triangle good. was at the end of the fight. Uh that was the end of the fight. Okay. That so he survived two. You it know. was a Dars choke. The last the last choke he had him in was a Dars, and the first one was an arm in guillotine. Uh he survived two of them. It was really speaks to Sarukian's uh, obviously his fortitude. You know, uh, physically and mentally, mostly mentally, uh, just incredible. It, it reminded you of Volkanovski when he survived. I was just gonna say yeah. that with Ortega. Yeah, yeah. It really was. It was. It was quite a quite a thing to see. All right, let's get to the BMF, baby. Um, oh uh, before God. you set it up, the way if you're gonna have a BMF. Uh, belt. We know with that bad mother, you know what? If if you're gonna have that, that's the way it should be won. <laughs> if you're gonna have potentially, that, that's potentially today, one of the best fights ever. And to Dana White's point in the press conference afterwards, you couldn't have said it better than he said it. He said, "Look, a lot of times at the end where one guy's dominating." And that guy would have been, obviously, Holloway, where he's got the win. He don't have to do nothing but stay on his feet, dance around. He said, usually, you see a guy raise his arms, dance around. He's, you know, he's got it. Uh, he already knows that it's in the bank. And he that's how he ends it. But no. Now when you're fighting for a BMF, you can't do that. Yeah, it's got to be one man left standing. You can't. That's Not almost got to that. be. That's almost got to be a, a written into the BMF belt, like in fine print. <laughs> yeah, in fine print at the bottom of the belt. No man left standing. You must. You <laughs> only one Has man to be can a leave. Yeah, one man. Only Two one man, man can enter, leave. One man oh, leaves. That's right. No, uh, only one <laughs> man's allowed to leave. <laughs> BMF, and that's what Holloway. And and Ken, that's what Holloway did. He ten oh. seconds, fifteen. I don't know what it was, but one. left it. He he points to the. Come on, let's finish it here. Come on. Let's go. And he points to the mat. And of course, the great Gagey, he, 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 he meets him there. He obliges, of course. And, and they go at it. And oh, my goodness. Go ahead, Ken. I'm, oh, oh. Uh, potentially, potentially one of the best fights you'll ever see in the UFC. While it was, you know, somewhat one-sided for Holloway. You'll notice, I was, I'm dying here if you notice this. Every time... A gauge, he kind of dipped his head like he was considering a takedown or at least doing a level change. Max Holloway hit him with a spinning back kick every single time. It was but like, he was prepared. I'm assuming it was, yes, I was going to say, I'm assuming his trainers and his coaches had him ready for that. It was incredible. Like he was said, prepared with, the same way that 100%. Masvidal was prepared, prepared against um, the great, great... Askren. Uh, Askren, the great wrestler, he was prepared the same way. He knew that Askren would bend low to go for the takedown, and he timed it with the knee. So then Holloway points to the middle. As you said, they start unloading on each other with wide punches. Gaethje's being a little bit more wide, like you would always say, straight beats round. Connects, knocks him out, dangerous knockout on his face, out cold, completely unconscious. And Holloway not only gets the the belt and the victory, but he walks away with three hundred, six hundred thousand dollars. Six hundred. Fight of the he night, performance both. of the night. Yep, six hundred thousand dollars cash. Dana had increased it from fifty thousand to three hundred, and he got both. So he got six hundred thousand. And it was Holloway at the press conference who said, "We need to raise the." Um, Fight bonuses he, he for three hundred to three hundred. Wow! And then to get two Smart of them, man. wow! And just incredible. And uh, yeah, I'm dying to hear what you thought about the fight because there was a lot of things going on there in a five round fight, and it ends literally one second to go. Yeah, it was a listen. Dana White also said this in the uh, post fight press conference. He said, and this really does sum it up. He said, I make a living making, oh, 
I, I try to make a practice of not cursing even in a little way. I'm going to stick with it. But he said, I make, I, I make a living. I, I, I work in a business, make a living in a business, making oh, shh, moments. Oh, crap moments. <laughs> that's for sure. But, but with the S instead of crap. And that's what I do. I, we, we're in the business of making oh, shh, F moments. And that was an oh, shh moment. And that's what it was. It was like, that, that's the only way you could describe it. When you saw that, you were like, oh, shh. Uh, it's like I a mean, signature that's so, moment for Holloway for the rest of his career. Yeah, I'm, I'll tell you. Sums up his career perfectly. I had him in that fight. I, I picked him to win. I picked him on our show last week. I was one yeah. and one. I picked Hill. I was wrong, uh, way wrong. But I picked Holloway. I, I made a point uh, on the air with John Anik on ESPN the, uh, Friday when we were talking about this fight. I said, you know, I think the bookmakers got this one wrong. I think Holloway should be the favorite, not Gagey. And, and Gagey was the favorite. But uh, at the end of the day, Holloway... He, he knew his formula is his formula. He'll fight you anywhere. But really, he owns the outside with his jab and his legs. And that's what, what won the fight for him before that sensational you know walk-off. His legs, not just kicking. I don't mean kicking. I mean in agility. I mean mobility, movement. His legs and his jab. He, he uses his legs for two things. One, for defense to keep you off balance, keep the harder punch and gauge you off balance, not let him get set. And also to set up his offense where he could get different spots to pot shot you, different spots to put his combinations, and he puts beautiful combinations together. He also won the fight because he had quicker hands. But he really won the fight because his fight plan was perfect. And styles do make fights. <laughs> his style was a difficult style, difficult style for Gagey. Because he does own the outside, he is mobile, he is agile, he does move, he does keep you off balance, he does set up his offense off of that, and he does have faster hands, all of that. He controlled the rhythm of the fight. He controlled the distance of the fight. He controlled the range of the fight. He was the conductor in an orchestra. That's what he was. The only thing that he had, those small gloves instead of those sticks, you know, that the conductor has in an orchestra where he's basically controlling the orchestra. He's telling the string section, go ahead, strings, shut down strings. Okay, uh, okay, horns, go horns. Okay, horns, shut down horns. He was a conductor out there. He controlled everything that Gagey could do. He Gagey couldn't get off. He couldn't get off at the right distance. Yeah, Gagey maybe could have used the jab more. Uh, one thing Gagey could have done was start kicking to the legs earlier. He started doing it a little later. He he could have started doing it a little earlier. Try to take the wheels away. <laughs> that is so important to Holloway. He could have done, but Holloway makes it hard to do that because he moves those wheels. He doesn't. He doesn't make it. You know, he doesn't make it easy for you to catch him with those leg kicks. And he kicks back at you. He keeps you honest in that way. So, complete effort by Holloway. Magnificent, magnificent uh, display of abilities, cerebral, physically, boxing, everything. Uh, he, he, is, he is a special guy. Um, he's, you know, he's a guy that's been doing it a long time. We know the chin that he has. He's got that titanium chin. It's not even titanium. It's an alloy we haven't discovered yet. Um, he has that, but he. there was a moment. It might have been the only round that I gave to Gagey. I had it four rounds to one, it would have been, if it wasn't for the knockout. I, I had one round where Gagey dropped him. I don't know, again... I'm not seeing replays. I'm there live. So I don't know if his feet were off balance, but Gagey caught Holloway on the inside. Uh, it looked like a right hand behind the ear. And Holloway went down. And he's never been down, from, from my knowledge. And he went down, got right up. So again, I don't know if it was a legitimate knockdown. Maybe Rob knows. Uh, maybe you know. But it was a momentary thing. Uh, I'll give that round to Gagey. Gagey did more quick kicking too. Uh, 
So I'll give him one round. But otherwise, master class, master class by Holloway fighting his fight, not allowing Gagey to get it into a firefight. Um, Gagey is more patient and deliberate than he used to be. He used to just, you know, from the beginning, go into one gear and go get you. Now... He's a little, he showed in the Dustin Poirier fight, which was a big win for him, where he was more, he was just more patient, uh, not just wading in all the time. Uh, it got to a point where the only way he was probably going to win this fight was to wade in. Uh, but the problem was when you try to wade in with Holloway, it's like I often say, it's like trying to go through a bad neighborhood at night. You get mugged. You get mugged on the way in. Holloway has those long arms. He catches you where it's good for him before you could get to him, where he has the edge. Uh, he did. A, he puts punches together beautifully. He mixes up the punches beautifully. Um, just, a, again, a master class performance. And then at the end, there's a reason why he caught Gagey with that punch. When he got Gagey to engage with him at the end, and of course Gagey being a warrior, hats off to him too. Being a warrior, he, he's got a broken nose. He, he had two eye pokes, uh, what was it, in the second round? He had two eye pokes. He got a broken nose. Um, it, I, I'm pretty sure it was broken. Uh, with, with a kick. I, I mean, all of that, no excuses, Gagey. Just 100% warrior. And he goes and he meets him the last 10 seconds in the center of the ring. Here's the problem. Gagey, at that point, is not as fresh as Holloway because he took a lot during the night. So he's not as sharp. And the second problem, he's just throwing punches. Holloway doesn't just throw punches. He places punches. He placed a couple downstairs, and then the the. The killer punch, the one that knocked him out, he placed a couple down, he set him up beautifully downstairs, and then he dipped to his left like he was going to do something low again to his left, and he looped the right hand up top and caught him right on the button. And, and of course, Gagey, uh, as tough as he is, as great a chin as he has, never saw the punch coming. It was lights out, flat down, over. Um, but a Gagey's throwing Holloway's place in punches. Uh, it was just uh, tremendous. He, he earned that 600000 with that performance. And I'll finish with what I started with. If you're going to have a BMF belt, that's the way you do it. That's the way you do it. Yep. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Co-main for a title, women's title, Wei Li Zhang and Yan Zhaonan. Uh, incredible toughness by Zhao Nan. I mean, good Lord. Wei oh, Li oh, really was just oh. ragdolling her part of the fight. But, man, Zhao, Na Zhao Nan wouldn't go away. She showed Ken, tremendous Ken, to tremendous your point, heart. Ken, to your point, she was unconscious after the, what was the first round, right? He, she was That's unconscious. Exactly right. and, and, and the referee wasn't sure. The referee got down low, wasn't sure. The bell rang, and then... She lets go of the hold, and she's basically out. She's out. Yeah. She gets up 100%. half out. She gets up. She's half out, And then she goes in there the second round and then goes five rounds. I mean, you talk about heart. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, so oh tough. my God. Oh. Wei Li uh, Zhang why? gets the unanimous decision. But keep going. I, I'm dying to hear your thoughts on this one because that was an incredible fight. Uh, and listen, Wei Li walking into that ring, what a serious look. I mean, she hmm. looked locked in she was um uh, it was it was a uh, both of them are gifted fighters both of them are as tough as they come they're both tremendous but but of course zhang wiley is becoming a legend she's a world champion for a reason um she you know she's obviously special i think yan is special too but the only difference is Wiley is at that level that's not too many people will ever get to. Um, Zhang closed the gap fast while Yan was, uh, they were kind of feeling each other out in the first round. She closed the gap fast. She, uh, she struck first blood by scoring a knockdown, if you will. Uh, great, highly technical first round. 
both showing tremendous skills. And then at the end of the round, Yan is in that submission hold, and she's out. I mean, she's basically out. And yep. and she survives that at the bell. She gets up, and she goes and goes in the second round, and Zhang dominated the second. Uh, she's she, as I said, she's so strong, so smart, so talented. Uh, Yan is just everything that toughness is is supposed to be. Everything from a mental standpoint to a uh, a survival. The durability standpoint, everything. Uh, she survived the second round, incredible, Yen. And then actually, she catches Zhang a punch uh, at the end. Uh, actually, at the end, after being dominated in the second, she catches Zhang a good shot at the end of the second. Third round, Yen is again incredible that she's still there and she drops Zhang. Um, she she was actually in charge in the third round, and the third round was all Yan. Um, uh, so I had it two to one after two dominating rounds for Zhang. I gave the third round uh, two to one for Zhang after two dominant rounds by Zhang. I give the third round to Yan, and. Yen, she goes into the, obviously into the fourth round, I believe, down two to one. Uh, fourth round, Yen caught Zhang coming in, dropped her again. Zhang later got her on the mat and had control, full control. Uh, she's, I mean, she's so good on that mat. Uh, big round for Zhang in the fourth Three to one for Zhang going into the fifth round. Dominant performance at the end of the day for Zhang. Uh, Yen was like, I was trying to figure out a term for her, the way that she kept fighting back and kept surviving what she had to survive. And finally, I realized what the word was. It was Houdini. She was like the escape artist Houdini, uh, Yen. She... Um, she, you know, she she survived so many moments. Uh, Yen took a lot of punishment throughout the fight. She survived. She showed her, you know, really her character throughout the fight. Again, in the third round, winning a round, in my estimation, in a fight that was all Zhang. Uh, she she really. She she have her moment. She have her moment again, but it just wasn't going to be against the great Zhang. Gutsy effort by Yan, but outclassed as I think I put it, yep. outclassed by uh, the talent of the very special Zhang Wiley. Yep. And before we talk main event, Teddy, quick shout out to our sponsor today, Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is the all-in-one green drink to support your uh, physical well-being. Made from 75 whole food source ingredients. One scoop in the morning mixed with 8 to 10 ounces of water is all you need. Even if you're eating the healthiest diet, it's important to make sure you're getting all the micronutrients, probiotics, prebiotics, minerals, etc., etc., Athletic Greens has you covered. For listeners of the show, if you go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas and subscribe now, they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Travel packs invaluable, especially if you spend time on the road. That's when you really want to be making sure you're getting all your vitamins and minerals. So go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas to take advantage of the offer and take control of your uh, emotional and well-being with the healthiest of diets. Let's talk main event, Teddy. Very uh, anticlimactic after the card we had. Alex Perea just takes Jamal Hill apart, knocks him out in the first round, made it look easy. Uh, Jamal Hill got him with an illegal kick to the groin. The ref went to go in to check on him. Alex Perea waved him off and finished him in like three seconds later. Incredible performance from Perea. Um, dying to hear what you thought. How'd you like it? There's so many special guys in this sport. But what a special guy. Here's a guy who was a kickboxer. 
was never in MMA. You know, kickboxing part of MMA. Okay, whatever. I guess with the kicking. But never really, you know, MMA trained guy. He comes into the sport. And in like six fights, he wins the title, five, six, whatever it was. I don't, I don't know exactly. But he's got like 10 fights now, 11, whatever. He's, he's won two titles in different weight classes. Um, he's beaten all top guys. He is really incredible. <laughs> but there's something that's tangible about him, his left hook, his size, his power, his strength. His physicality, his striking ability, uh, his ability to kick your legs out if he has to. He can do that with the best of them. Take away your foundation. I've never seen a house yet that remains standing if there was no foundation. The house can't stand without foundation. He knows how to do that too. He didn't have to do a lot of that as it turned out. But there's something that's not as, it's tangible at the end of the day. But it's not as easy to quantify. And I'm going to touch on that. And by the way, that was, he, he, by the way, one quick, one quick thing. He was in, in his fourth fight in the UFC, he beat Izzy to win the uh, middleweight title. And that was his eighth MMA fight in any organization. And since then, since coming into the UFC, that was his fourth fight. Uh, every single fight after that was a title fight with the exception of Jan Blahovic, which he won by split decision. So he lost the f title to Izzy. Then he moved up to light heavy and beat Prohaska. And now he beats Jamel Hill to defend the title. Yeah, that's like what uh, Lomachenko did in boxing and uh, in a way did in boxing, mm -hmm. winning titles so fast. Also, so uh, fast. Rigging the Al. We yep. shouldn't forget about how great he was. Um, the great, great Cuban fighter that came over he won two olympics then he came over and won the title in a few fights the one thing worth pointing out the main main difference is here the weight classes are so big in uh in ufs in mma versus boxing these weight classes are like 15 pounds apart i'll tell you what the bigger difference is all those great fighters i mentioned in a way lomachenko you know rigging the out they they had of course boxing experience in amateurs this guy right. came into MMA with no MMA experience other than kickboxing. That's, right. That's incredible. Yep. So That's crazy. It is. So much the to thing know. I was, he's already got, now he's got a black belt. Yep. The thing I was touching on. Gave him his black belt after the fight. By the way, you know, one, sorry, one quick thing. He lost his first MMA fight by uh, rear naked choke in 2015. First fight in a, uh, in a second tier division. He gets choked out. Yeah, he went and learned. Like, like Adesanya, like all those great fighters, where they their their forte is not on the mat. It's not grappling, wrestling, jujitsu. It's none of that. But they learn how to they learn how to defend the takedowns. They learn how to defend the submission holds. They learn that, and Pereira has learned that. He knows where his bread's buttered. It's standing. But but he also knows he has to know how to handle himself if he is on the mat. And now he's learned that. But but for the most part, he doesn't go there anymore, which is not a bad idea. Here, Here's the thing that I was making a point that nobody else has really talked about yet. He, and I talked about it on ESPN after the fights the other night with Anik. Uh, who's the other great commentator I was working with? Brett, Brett uh, Okamoto. Am I saying it right? Okamoto, say yep, that. yep, that's right. He, matter of fact, he had his beautiful three-year-old son there. What a cute kid. Uh, he's he's very good at what he does, Brett, and um, yeah. only getting better. So, but John Anik is the number one guy. And and there's another guy there, too, that does a good job. I forget his name. He, he was doing a lot of the stuff, too, when Anik wasn't doing it. But they're all good. But the point I'm making about Pereira, we know about his physicality. We know about his weight drops and his weight gains, we, all that stuff. And please don't call him a weight bully because you're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot if you call him a weight bully because he makes the weight legitimately the way anyone else makes it. And the reason why he's so good is not because he's a weight bully. It's because he's so good. So, anyway, there was actually people 
that thought when they saw the weight gain that he made before the fight that Hill was going to knock him out because of that. So they actually look at it two ways. Some people look at it if you win as an advantage. If you lose, they say, oh, it was a disadvantage because you put on too much weight. You came down too low. You hurt your body to make the weight. And then you put on too much weight and you became sluggish. You became that. You became something that was detrimental to you. All that matters in this case is how good Pereira is as a fighter, mentally, technically, and physically. We know about his left hook. <laughs> we know about his physical power, his ability to kick out your legs, all that. But what really was on display that night, I know the left hook, the timing of it. I know he gradually walked downhill, which he did. <laughs> he put Hill in a position where he couldn't set the punch. He had Hill on his back heel. He pushed Hill back <laughs> while he was set to punch, while he was in power position, Pereira. He kept Hill at a disadvantage in that way. He pushed him back physically, and he slowly closed the gap without leaving himself open to a counter, without being reckless. He got into position where he forced Hill to throw a punch. I think it was a left hand from the southpaw position. And Pereira, as Hill threw the punch, Pereira timed him with a beautiful left hook, like a hybrid left hook. Anthony Smith made a good point where he said uh, it was like a hybrid. Was it Smith or Chael? Uh Well, either one of them was making a good point. Usually he'd throw the hook where the elbow comes up and it's a traditional hook, but he threw it like a half uppercut, half hook, a hybrid, I call it, where it made sense to throw it that way because that's where the opening was. So he adapted. There's more ways than one to skin a cat and more ways than one to throw a left hook. And I've talked about that in the past. And that's what he displayed. He displayed the ability to be able to adapt to what he had to adapt to. And he timed the left hook beautifully as Hill was throwing his left hand and he caught him and Hill never saw it and he knocked him out. But here's the part that we're missing. The part that, again, is hard for people to wrap their heads around because you don't see it the way, you know, it's not a visual the way that a left hook is a visual. It is his persona. It is his presence it, it, is, it is his physical force of presence that actually becomes tangible. You could feel it. When he walked into that ring, his stare was different than any stare I've ever seen. It was like a stare from a tribal warrior. It was, it was like, it was a diff, the only thing missing was war paint. It was a, mm -hmm. it was a, it was a stare that was a debilitating stare, a serious stare. Some of the stares are put on; they're created stares for the benefit of trying to intimidate your opponent, you know. And they're artificial. This one is not artificial. This one is is just a cold stare, kind of like Roberto Duran when he was young, and he had those cold, cold eyes that you could get lost in. There was, you saw nothing back when you looked into him. That, and Sonny Liston had that. That is the kind of stare. It, I'm telling you, it, was, it, was, it caught my attention. And, it, and he did not unlock from it all the way up to where they touched gloves and went back to their corners to start the fight. <laughs> that stare coupled with his physical presence, that physical force that that he emanates, that, that just emanates from him, that, that just comes off, that breaks somebody down almost as much as a left hook. Put it this way, it prepares him. You know how a cook has to prepare the steak before he puts it on the grill, he's got to saute yep. it. He's got to he's got to tenderize it. You know, well, that's kind of what the stand does. That's kind of what the physical force of his presence when he's coming at you does. It tenderizes the steak. It prepares it for the grill. It prepares it for the oven. It prepares it for the left hook. 
And that's, that's what I got out of that night, as short as it was. That we talk about in boxing and in life, sometimes somebody, Cus used to talk about this with me, where somebody can put themselves in a position to make you feel like they're an unstoppable force. Like there's not like you have no say. Like like you can't stop what's going to happen to you. Like it's an unstoppable force. That there there's uh there's there's something uh, a force of nature where it's just going to overcome you. He comes close to being that unstoppable force. I know he got knocked out by Izzy. He drew a left hook in front. Izzy is so special. Izzy was on the ropes. He got a little reckless Pereira. He came in there for the finish. He drew a left hook in front. And Izzy, being being ready for that, caught him with the right hand in between in the rematch. Uh, and and he, knocked out, he knocked out Pereira. But put that aside. What I saw the other night, and what I saw... I've seen in the past, but what I saw the other night was the unstoppable force that Cus talks about. This, this, this act of nature that you actually like a tornado coming. You can't stop the tornado. You see a tornado coming. You see a hurricane coming. What happens? You don't feel good. You don't feel like I'm going to stand my ground and I'm going to handle this tornado. No. Yeah, you feel like oh my God, I'm going to be. Destroyed by this tornado. He makes you feel that way. I felt it. I actually felt And I know Hill felt it. Ken, I know Hill felt it. Before he ever felt a punch, he felt that, that draining, immovable object coming at him with that stare like there ain't nothing you can do about it. You're mine. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get you, then I'm going to gut you, fillet you, put you on a stick, and take, <laughs> you, back, take you back to my uh, cave <laughs> where, you know, I, I, might have a, I might have a nice meal. I mean, I, I'm just, I know I'm giving a visual that's a crazy, I, I'm going way out there to, to, to actually sh- explain what, I'm, what I saw, to personify it for you. And that's what I saw. That's what I felt. I felt this guy that he just, he drained you with his presence. He drained you with that, with that undeniable force of nature that you can't stop me. George Foreman used to do that with some guys physically. And then he ran into Muhammad Ali. And then he came back 10 years later and he showed how great he was by learning from that and creating another George Foreman to win the title at 45, which was unheard of. But Pereira, that's what, that's what he is right now. And I, th- I think he broke Hill down before that hook ever landed, where, he, again, he put him on his back foot, he closed the gap in a very professional manner, very, very deliberately, where he didn't leave any openings, and he timed him with the left hook. When when Hill, but when Hill threw that punch, it was almost a defensive type punch because I think he was feeling already wilted a little bit. So anyway, that's all I have for that. It's enough I, because it was a one round spectacular knockout. Um, just, just, I hope the people, I hope that I explained it the way I wanted to explain it. I hope there's people out there that can appreciate that. And um, because I appreciated it. I appreciated it. To beat Pereira, you got to be, you got to be damn good athletically. You got to be damn, like Izzy, you got to be damn good in all departments. But you got to be damn good up here, upstairs in the attic. You, you got to be really, really, really fortified in that area. You got to be like a Muhammad Ali was with George Foreman. Really, at this point, if you're not that way mentally, you ain't beating this guy. You're not beating this guy. 
That's a great point. Um, well, that's a pretty thorough breakdown of all the action from the UFC. Incredible night. Um, I definitely want to talk now about a preview of the Devin Haney-Ryan Garcia fight. This is a fight that I'm hoping to get over with just so Ryan Garcia can get back to um, some peace in his life because some of the social media behavior is just completely out of character and it seems uh, unsettling to say the least. But... Um, I'm going to get you the lines from the team at my bookie before the end of the uh, analysis. But for now, what are you looking for in this fight? And how concerned are you about the behavior of Ryan on social media leading into the fight? I'm disappointed with the New York State Athletic Commission. As far as I know, they never forced him, him being Garcia, with all the behavior that we're all aware of, his posting, his talking about that he was kidnapped a month ago, two months ago by a group that took him in the woods and forced him to watch little kids get raped, to his drinking openly, to his smoking, you know, weed openly in training camp, before training camp, whatever he was doing, to him saying that his therapist said that it's good to do hallucinogenics, <laughs> to him posting things, or oh, just one crazy thing after, one disturbing thing after another for months of that. <laughs> and then, he only gets into camp about five weeks before the fight. Then he posted videos of himself with his trainer. Some of them weren't even his trainer, but with his trainer uh, hitting the pads for a minute, a half a minute, two minutes, hitting his pads. And, and he was like out in a parking lot. It, it wasn't even in the gym. And that was only four or five weeks before the fight. And... You know, and, and some of these idiot fans were like, oh, you look good. You, you, wow, you're looking sharp there. You're ready, Ryan. He's hitting pads. And, and even then, his muscle tone didn't look good. He didn't look like he was in shape. And, and it was in the midst of all this craziness. <laughs> if the New York State Athletic Commission, which I called for a month ago on this air, if they did not have him evaluated, by some of their doctors, and I mean on a psychiatric level, not just a physical level, not just with his pulse and his heart rate and all that stuff. I, I mean, if they didn't have him talk to some professional people in that field, when you're showing that kind of conduct that begs to ask, are you okay mentally? Are you okay before you get in the ring? There's only one reason why we have commissions, to... Ensure the welfare and health of a fighter going into a ring. To make sure that mentally and physically they are of good, sound mind and body. I don't know that you can say that about Garcia if you didn't evaluate him with the right people. So that's number one. I'm saying New York State Athletic Commission is on the, is on the hook here. They are on the hook if something... They, they are really... If something, God forbid, happens to this kid along the lines of Oliver McCall. Yeah, there's a precedent for this. Oliver McCall, years ago, he had knocked out Lennox Lewis in a rematch. He had an alcohol, drug problems, different problems going on, emotional problems. He was basically in, before the fight, the weeks before the fight, he was basically in a rehab center. That is no place to be when you're fighting, period. Forget about fighting for the title. When you're fighting, you should not be in that kind of atmosphere, that kind of state of mind, state of body. He was in a rehab. And what happened? Oliver McCall, what was the second round? Whatever round it was. Uh, Rob, if you can, you're going to put a clip of that up there. What happened? All right, Rob? Where the fans can see what I'm talking about in case they don't know. He broke down in the middle of the fight in a ring. Never seen anything like this before. And he started crying. Crying. And Lennox Lewis actually hit him a punch while he was crying. And the referee had no choice but to stop the fight. He just had a breakdown. He had a breakdown. I think Garcia, it's, it's fair to say, he might have been having a breakdown in training. Maybe not. Maybe, but there's, there's no room. There's no room for a mistake here. If we're saying maybe, that's enough to make sure that he's okay. That enough. The ring is dangerous enough. You don't have to go in there not, not right. It's already dangerous enough when you go in there right. So that's number one. Number two, 
You want me to pick the fight? You want me to just, you know, break the fight down? I don't see, unless Haney has, is completely gets blindsided by this and believes that he's got nothing in front of him. Garcia still has a good left hook. He's still got a good jab. Maybe it's only for one, two, three rounds. I don't know. But he can still punch with the left hook. Unless, unless Haney and his father, and I, they do a good job. They're always ready. Unless they get blindsided, like I said, and they really say, ah, this guy is a joke. We're going to go in there. We're going to smoke the guy. We're going to go home and run into a punch and because they're reckless. Unless that happens, and I don't see it happening. I cannot see. And, and I go out on a limb. You, you fans out there that tear me apart when I'm wrong, but I don't, I don't hide. I go out on a limb. I say it. And I stand by it, right or wrong, afterwards. I'm here. I ain't going nowhere. (laughs) So I go out there and I say, and if I'm wrong, I know I leave myself open to what comes with that. That's okay. That's part of what we do here. We put ourselves on this stage. You got to take the good with the bad. You're putting yourself out on a limb sometimes. You have to do it. I'm not going to play it safe and stand in the middle of the fence. Anyone could do that. Unless Haney goes in there completely reckless, completely the the opposite of what he has shown himself to be in his fight so far as a responsible guy in the ring, a guy who's ready, a guy who's sharp, a guy who's responsible defensively, offensively, a guy who controls the outside, he's a sharpshooter with combination, he controls range. Unless he goes in there and tries to be a bull in the china shop, again, thinking that he's got a, uh, you know, a dead man walking, if you will, in front of him. Other than that, which I don't expect, I cannot see Garcia surviving more than six rounds, five, six rounds. I can't. It takes Haiti a little while to get going sometimes. You know, sometimes it'll take him a round or two, you know, to get to get warmed up a little bit. But... I, I I can't see it going more than half of the fight. I can't. Um, maybe it goes seven, but five six rounds. I I I would think that Haney destroys him. Uh, that he 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 controls the outside. Let me give you the lines from our friends at MyBookie. And if you're going to bet on the fight, please go to MyBookie.ag. Use the promo code ATLAS for a 50% credit on your first deposit. Again, MyBookie.ag. Teddy, the line on this one is getting crazy now. I don't think it was this wide before, but I'm sure some. No, it wasn't. It started out like an even fight. It started out like an even mm-hmm. fight. Devin Haney, minus 900. Ryan Garcia, plus 500. Yeah, listen... I'm I'm not telling anyone go lay nine hundred to win a hundred, but this might be one time that I would say that. Um, what's the under over? I look at that. Look at that proposition. Yeah, what's very that? Very good. O- over under over ten and a half. You have to lay two sixty. Under plus one seventy eight. Under ten and a half rounds. So they're thinking it's going the over and Devin yeah, Haney's going to win a decision. I'm taking under. I'm taking under, under plus money. Uh, I'm taking the money at under because I don't think Garcia can be physically or mentally right for this fight. Hey, look, if he did this to to promote the fight, if he did this to get more pay per view buys, if he did this to make his social media bit bigger, because I understand he gained maybe two million more views since this has been going on on his social media, they've already had 9 million. Now it's like 11 million, whatever it is, somewhere in that neighborhood. If he did it for that reason, if he did that consciously, um, deliberately, oh my God. First of all, he's the greatest actor ever. He should go to Hollywood and retire from (laughs) boxing. That's number one. He really should. And, and, (laughs) And, you know, if he did that, then wow. What can I say? What can I say? But other than that, I look at things for what I can see them to be. I, I, and all I can see, you know, that old saying, if it walks like a duck and sounds like a duck, usually it's a duck. When a guy is acting this way, usually there's something wrong. Again, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. 
I cannot see unless Haiti and his father have fallen into a trap of saying this is just going to be an easy one. And again, these guys don't do that. So I I I see Haiti Haiti Garcia's thing. He he should use his jab to control range. He's a little longer than Haiti. He should do that. He should also look for the left hook to the body and look to try to set traps to catch Haiti coming in uh, with the left hook. Also set the table with his jab and eat with the right hand. That's what Garcia should do. Maybe he'll start out doing that. I don't see he can sustain it from what I've seen in his training or lack of training and craziness that have led to this point. Um, what's Haney want to do? He might want to be more aggressive. He showed in the Lomachenko fight. He showed in the Prograce fight that he is getting more aggressive now uh, when, when he thinks it's the right time to be. He's setting himself more. He's not a huge puncher, but he, he catches you clean. He's a sharpshooter. He's a decent puncher. Uh, Garcia is a better puncher with the one punch with the left hook. But Haney is setting himself, bending his knees, sitting down more. He is getting a little bit more, like I said, assertive. Uh, what he used to do was just control the outside, look to pot shot, look to sniper you uh, with, with those real sharp punches and combinations he can put together, controls range. I think that he needs to, he needs to do that early, Haney. That's his thing. But I have a feeling at some point he's going to be inclined to do what he's been showing in his last two fights or, or in the Lomachenko and Pro Grace fight where he is becoming a little more assertive. He will probably look, if he sees that Garcia doesn't look right, he'll probably start to put the pedal to the metal a little more, to go against what he's been throughout his career, a more aggressive fighter. That could turn out where he could get rid of Garcia or it could turn out to be a dangerous tactic where he could walk into a left hook of Garcia, a desperate left hook of Garcia. That he better be careful of. If I was Haney, I'd be practicing feints before I come in that front door. I'd be making sure my jab is, is clear in the way. I'd be making sure I do not come in in any kind of reckless fashion. No matter what Garcia has, has put up on his Twitter account. At the end of the day, I'm going to say it's going to be tactical early. And then Haney... Garcia is going to do whatever he can do early on. Haney's going to deal with it in a tactical way. And then Haney's going to start to feel like, okay, now I'm going to start to get to him and start to maybe walk him down again. That is not his style. But I can see him doing a little bit of it. But he better do it right. He better do it right. Otherwise... Something crazy could happen. And Ryan Garcia could look like a genius. <laughs> you know, that, that he uh, set this whole thing up. But at the end of the day, I'm taking Haney. Some of the props. Devin Haney by decision is 176. Devin Haney by KO is plus 183. So if you like De Haney in the under, that might be some good value. Ha uh, Haney by KO, Haney. plus 183. Yeah. Uh, will the uh, will the fight go the distance? Plus one fifty for no, minus two twelve for yes. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna take Haney by knockout. What do I get back? Plus one seventy. Did you tell me? Haney by knockout gets you one eighty three. All right, that's even better. So give me one eighty three for my hundred. I'll take Haney by knockout. Um, you know, I like the under uh, a little bit. Like I said. Uh, you know, and then at the end of the day, I I don't I hate the late nine hundred, but you know, if you wanna if if you just feel that Haney's gonna win a fight, I guess in in any way that he does it, you take uh, minus nine hundred. Actually, there's a way to get a, around that lay and all that wood, where you just take Haney by decision, and then you don't have to lay right. Yep. What would that be? Yeah. That's what I would do. I, if I, you want, if you want Haney by decision, you get him. Uh, you're laying one seventy six instead of uh, 
Instead plus of 183 on. Haney by KO, you're getting plus 183, and then on the uh, money line, minus 900. Yeah, so I, I'm not going to lay 900. If I if I like Haney, I, but, you know, the only problem is if you take him by decision and he knocks him out, that's, yeah. that's the only thing. So yep. I, I, guess, I guess for the money value for me with my bookie, uh, I think I'm just going to – I'm going to – do a little bit on the under, a little bit on the Haney by knockout. Um, and, and maybe I'd take Garcia uh, for a peanut on the knockout. Garcia for just to save a bet. Just, just plus 890. Gar- Garcia yeah. by knockout, plus 890. That's the only way I see him winning. If, if I can't see him sustaining a fight where he jabs all night, he keeps himself together all night, I can't see that. Uh, I don't see that he's ready physically or mentally. I can see a scenario I can where... I see a he, scenario... Yeah, I can see a scenario, too, where Haney gets reckless, maybe. That's the only scenario I can see for Garcia to win. Haney gets reckless, and Garcia catches him a big left hook or whatever and, and knocks him out. Other than that, I can't... Like, I can't see a sustained, solid effort by Garcia at this point from everything we know. Where he 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 controls range, he uses his jab, you know, he sets traps. He, he you know, I I just you got to be together to be able to sustain that kind of fight where you're controlling a guy with a jab at the right distance all night long. You got to really be together. I can't see that. I could see the possibility of a knockout that he that Haney walks into some. So I'll take a little play. What will I get if I take a little play? On Garcia by knockout, I get plus eight plus eight ninety. All right, that's it. Those are my plays. Here's what I could see happening: is that Haney outboxes him, Garcia gets frustrated, wants to press the action, re- rushes in recklessly himself, and gets dropped by um, Devin Haney. I can't see Devin Haney being irrational, but Ryan, by all his behaviors outside of the ring, like we've discussed before. People think it's brave to just go in winging punches, but I feel like this may be one of these things where, at least leading up to the fight, it looks like there's something going on with Ryan where he's just like, I'm getting this over with. I'm going to rush in and either knock him out or get knocked out. Um, yeah, so when you rush see, in like, like that, usually it's not about brave or not brave. It's usually about <laughs> being out of control, you know, where, yep. where you just want to get some over with. But look, at the end of the day... Um, I, at the end of the day, uh, those would be my plays. I just, I, I'll, I'll be, I'll be shocked. You know, I know Haney's not the finishing kind of seek and destroy guy, so that's probably why the bookmakers have it in line for it to go the rounds. Um, I just think that this is. Uh, I'm going to ask a crazy question. You know, the Super Bowl, you can bet anything. You bet the, you know, what what's the song? What song's going to be the first song? You know, what color the Gatorade's going to be? <laughs> what the flip of the coin's going to be? Right? They got props for everything. Do they have a prop? And if they don't, they should. And I'm not trying to be a jerk, but... They should probably because of what has happened, what what the the you know what the what's going on with this fight, the environment of this fight, everything that the craziness that we're talking about. I would like to know if there was a prop on whether or not Garcia is either going to quit in his corner or have a mental breakdown in the middle of the ring. Like like Oliver McCall did. Again. Yeah, I don't I, see I'm, that I don't see that on, on my bookie, just will it go the distance, method method of victory and the over under and straight money line. But I, I just because Oliver McCall, like I said, that poor yeah. guy, he went in there under those extreme circumstances where he shouldn't have been in the ring. His people around him, quite frankly, should not have had him in a ring against Lennox Lewis, knowing what he had been through for the weeks before that fight, you know, in, in detox and everything else. So 
that would be one of my thoughts is, will we see some kind of, you know, we've seen a lot of erratic behavior and a lot of craziness leading up to this fight, which is not usually yep. what you, it's not usually what you see leading up to a fight. That's right. So I'm so how am I? So I'm not that crazy to say. Okay, I wonder then if we'll see something again that's unexpected during the fight, in the middle of the fight. Anyway, um, I hope he's okay. I'll finish with that, Ken. I hope that I agree with you. Is okay. I just hope he's okay. I hope he's all right from a human standpoint. Uh, I know he's getting paid. I hope that's not all this is about. I I really do, um, but I you know if, if yeah I'm Garcia, with you. He's a ni- he's a nice kid. All. I know I know that I've been told that the tickets were not selling for the fight, not selling that they they're coming up with some way of of I don't know if it's going to be painting the room if you want to call it that or giving. Dropping the price of tickets, uh, where you're gonna get the place to be sold out the way you want it to be sold. But I, I had heard from reliable sources that the other day, a few days ago, it was not selling. Now the pay per view probably would do very good because of all this controversy, all of this stuff that's been out there about Garcia. You know, people are curious. You know, people will tune in. There might even be some people that aren't normally prone to watching these fights, but will tune in to say, oh, that's the guy that was on social media, you know, talking about all this crazy stuff. Uh, that Let's take a look at this. So the pay-per-view numbers might be really good, but... Um, well, I can tell you, I always, I always check ticket prices because uh, I like to go to a lot of them at the last minute, and these tickets are very reasonably priced. I mean, you can get a good seat down low for two grand. It looks like there's seats available in every section. By contrast, if you check UFC pay-per-view the week before the fight, like there might be three tickets left in the entire section. In this, where I'm looking now on the different floor seats, there are seats in every section still available, reasonably priced, like floor seats, 1000 bucks in uh, 11th row, which... I mean, you ain't getting that in the UFC, so. I don't know if we have a way of knowing this, but I wonder if they dropped the prices. Because, again. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I, was, I was hearing that they were not doing good at the box office. Put it that way. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of money on the line. Uh, both fighters you know, will get paid well. Uh, to the credit of Haney, he took less money. He took a lesser cut. Then Garcia, he's the champ. I would argue he should get a bigger cut. But I know the reality, like Canelo, I get the reality. The guy that was the star attraction, if you will, the guy that's uh, the, the hotter commodity, the guy that's selling the fight, the guy that has more exposure, the guy that has more of the it factor, if you will, whatever. The, the guy that draws more people. That's Garcia. So... Haney, to make this fight, which speaks good to him, he took less of a cut. You know, he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't, he didn't, number one, he didn't look to get the higher cut, like 60-40 or whatever, because he's the champ. Uh, He didn't even look to get 50-50. He took uh, whatever, I don't know, I don't want to say numbers if I'm not 100% sure, but I know that he took a cut, uh, of the you know of the of of the he took less than Garcia to make this fight yeah well it's going to be interesting and I'm looking forward to watching it um this coming Saturday from Brooklyn the Barclays Center um Teddy that's all I got unless you've got something else before we say goodbye that was a pretty thorough breakdown yeah that was a good show I felt it was a good show the people that didn't feel I don't it's okay Go go get a cheeseburger, um, you know, and a and couple pickles on the side and have a nice day. Um, <laughs> other than that, I would say what I said when I started the show for our great fans out there that happened to celebrate Passover. Happy Passover. And uh, I just say God bless everyone. 
God bless. Everyone have a great week, and we'll be back next week. Thanks for being with us. Please subscribe to the show on YouTube, and thanks for being with us today. See you next week. Boom.